there were two people that were uh, driving in different directions. They had a car wreck. And they were both about 30 years old, and it was about dusk. And thankfully, neither one of them were hurt. But when they got on the car, they realized that both of their cars were probably going to be totaled. And thankfully, uh, the woman got out of the car, and she realized she was not hurt. She looked at the fellow and realized he was not hurt either. And then she was sort of, kind of that chemistry thing took over with both of them. She looked at him and was just awestruck. What a handsome man this is. And she was kind of blubbering, trying to figure out something to say. And she says, oh, you're a man. And I'm a woman. And we had this wreck. And thankfully, neither one of us are hurt. But our cars are demolished. But maybe this is a sign from God that we were supposed to meet. And maybe we should celebrate that in the future. Maybe we are to live our life together in peace. Well, the guy was equally smitten with her. And when he heard those words, he just went over the top. He, he had no idea what to say. And he said, I agree. Yes, maybe this is a sign from God. There was this little pause. And then she said, she looked in her car and said, oh, look, here's another sign from God. You see this bottle of wine? It survived the car crash. And maybe we should open this bottle of wine and, and celebrate the sign of God that he is to, to bring us together to live a life of peace together. And he said, okay. And she handed him the bottle and he opened up. And by this time, he was over the top smitten. He, he just could not take his eyes off of her. And he took the bottle and he took a long swig. And she kept talking. And every time he would take the bottle and give it back to her, she'd say, keep going. And, and, and she talked some more. And this happened until he finished about half of the bottle. And then about that time, she noticed that over his back shoulder, which he couldn't see, a police car was slowly making uh, its way there. And he said, well, now, are you sure you don't want some? And she said, oh, I'm sure. And she took the bottle back, put the cap on it, gave it back to him, and said, I'm just going to wait for the police. <laughs> the title of today's message is Trust. What are we really trusting uh, in this case, this man was sort of like me in college, trusting the woman that uh, he was smitten by, and it was going to cost him significantly when the police showed up. Uh, when I was in college, as many of you know, I was not a Christian, and I had several Christian uh, friends um, that tried to share the Lord with me, and I was just not interested at all. And one of the reasons I was not interested was that it seemed to me, as a freshman and sophomore, junior in college, that these Christians had a crutch. That they, they needed God in some way, and I didn't see any need in my life for God at all. And I sort of saw these Christians as weak. How, you know, you, you, you really need a crutch to live life. Now, I was tremendously idealistic and naive. And I, I just assumed, without even knowing it, that, that I knew how to handle life. And I knew how to handle relationships. And I knew how to handle me. And I knew how to handle the problems that would come down. I was tremendously naive about, the, about that. And um, in your handout, the issue is not to have a crutch or not have a crutch. The issue is how trustworthy is your crutch. All of us, Christian or atheist, anybody, we all trust something to make life work. You say, well, I trust me. That's a crutch. Uh, when we get married, we typically, uh, whether we admit it or not or aware of it, we are trusting our spouse to do for us what only God can do. Your spouse is a crutch. Uh, Richard mentioned money. Money can be a crutch. Career can be a crutch. Uh, your parents or your, your peer group or your friends or what we own, all of these things are things that we, without really connecting the dots, are, th are crutches that we are using to make life work or to find that sense of satisfaction that we own. When I look back at my life in college, I think I had about 10 different crutches. I was trusting me at one level to get what I needed. I was trusting my friends at another level. I was trusting uh, my sports ability. I was trusting my humor. At different times, I was trusting my parents or their friends to, to sort of, when I was around them, to sort of grow up a little bit and feel like I, I had something going. I, I, I'm moving in a good direction. I'm, I'm going to be a good adult here. I trusted my professors, when I, my pre-med professors, when I was around them to try to impress them. That was a crutch. 
I, I trusted uh, girls. I was always trying to date girls that I thought were clearly out of my league. And, and so there was an element of both trusting me and trusting them for a sense of validation. Altogether, I think I had about 10 crutches. Now, what is so odd to me is I had no idea that I was trusting any of those things for, for, for my well-being. I was completely blind, completely oblivious. I had about 10 crutches. The issue is not do we have a crutch or how many crutches. What, what's the strength of the crutch or crutches to which we are really depending? Proverbs 29, 25 says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts the Lord is kept safe. So fear of man just means who am I really trusting? Am I trusting me? That's one aspect of fear of man. Am I trusting my spouse? Am I trusting my parents for what they think of me? Am I trusting my teenagers for what they think of me? All, am I trusting my boss or my... We all have things of which we trust. And, and all of these things, Proverbs says, will be a snare if we're not trusting God. Eventually, it's going to catch us. Eventually, things are not going to go the way we thought they should play out eventually. And the very things that we're trusting, sometimes we end up wrecking without us knowing it. Well, the, bless, the trust is a blessing from, from God. Um, Jeremiah 17, 5 says, this is what the Lord says, cursed is the one who trusts in man. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. Who draws strength from mere flesh, whether that's your own or somebody else, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Now, it's possible to be a Christian and to think that, oh, yeah, I'm trusting God, I'm not trusting flesh. But in any given moment of our life, in any situation, we can be trusting almost anything else except God in that moment. Your kids, your work, finance, anything can be, can, we, we, we will slowly shift in there. And he says here, this is a bad idea whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person, then he gives us a visual, that person would be like a bush in the wastelands. Think about the desert. They will not see prosperity when it comes. And prosperity in the Bible is bigger than just financial prosperity. It's prosperity personally or prosperity relationally. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. So the picture here is when we are really, really, really trusting someone or ourselves to do for us what only God can do, eventually we're going to find ourselves in the Mojave Desert, metaphorically speaking, where we are alone or empty or with a parched, hungry soul that, that, that just cannot find satisfaction. Now the contrast, Jeremiah says, verse 7, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him. Now, when the Bible says about being confident in God, it doesn't mean the feeling of confidence. Confidence in the Bible means just sort of a settled assurance down in your gut that God is trustworthy. And on that basis, I'm going to live. They will be like a tree, and here's the opposite metaphor, the opposite image that's painted here. They will be like a tree planted by uh, water that sends out its roots by the stream, uh, it does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So even, even when uh, times are hard, as he says, says here, or when there's a drought, uh, metaphorically speaking, or you feel hungry or thirsty or uh, like a drought, something's missing, uh, water is nearby and will con to continue to sustain you. Now, the question I think about when I think about this the issue of trust is there are different values that, all, that everybody sort of aspires to. Uh, I want to be, a, as Richard mentioned, I want to be a loving person. I want to be a faithful person to my word and faithful to my vows. I want to be a person of integrity, a person of honesty. But I wonder how many of us would put the value of trust as something I aspire as a value. Probably that would not be in the top five things or maybe even ten things that any of us would put. I really want to really be a person who trusts God, honors God by trust. Now, what's so surprising to me about that is that what I do hear about all the time is how stressed people are. I'm so stressed in my marriage. I'm so stressed with finances. I'm so stressed at work. I'm so stressed with my parents. I'm so stressed with my kids. 
I'm so stressed at work. I'm so stressed with my boss. I'm so stressed with deadlines. It's almost like all of us are just kind of walking around with this, this invisible weight on our shoulders of stress. Now, when we typically think about stress, we make the mistake of thinking stress is about busyness, something outside of us, our schedule. We need to scale back. And there are times where that's important. But stress is an inner value. It's something that happens inside of us. Uh, stress is born in your handout when I am trusting anything other than God for things I consider essential to my well-being. In its simplest form of thinking about stress, this is the culprit. That in my heart, whether I'm aware of it or not, it now all depends upon me. And now it also, also depends upon you coming through for me and doing for me what only God can do. Or it, it, it's now I need to, as Richard talked about, with money or career to, to reach certain goals. It depends upon me. When things depend upon me, stress is born. It just may be a little baby, <clears throat> but eventually <clears throat> that little baby, <clears throat> as we continue to sort of live on the basis of that, be becomes a toddler. And the toddler is what uh, we call uh, anxiety or worry. This is when stress peeks its head above your awareness and says, hello, I'm over here. Are you sure you want to trust something as uncertain as you? Or trust something uh, as uncertain as your spouse? Or uncertain as money or your boss or your career? Are you sure you want to do that? And typically what we say is, oh, I don't like to feel anxious. You know, God, please help me not to feel, help me not to feel worried. But we don't see what's causing that anxiety and worry. And that is we are depending upon ourselves or one or more people or certain outcomes. So that's when a, a stress becomes kind of like a toddler. Well, stress becomes a teenager uh, through anger. And the way that that happens is, is we double down on our dependence. All I'm asking from you is to thank me when, when I do something for you. All I'm asking is for a little consideration. All I'm asking for is that you would communicate more with me. We double down on depending upon ourselves and or someone to come through for us. And when they don't or when we don't, we get angry. It's all a matter of trust. Who am I really trusting for myself? Uh, apparent uncertainty is, uh, gives evidence of faulty trust. Anger is evidence of faulty trust. Doubling down is evidence of faulty trust. On the inside of your handout, the nemesis here is control. And what we love to, to just assume about ourselves is we're under control. We've got it under control. We like to assume that we, we have more control over things than we really do. And Richard mentioned this uh, in his devotional just a few minutes ago. But control, as long as the control lies in my hand for whatever it is I'm pursuing, then stress is inevitable. And what's the antidote? The antidote is trust. Trust is delightfully depending on God for my well-being. Now, as Christians, we, we, we trust God generically, and that's a good thing. But in our day-to-day -day lives, there are plenty of times, for me, this happens five or ten times a day on average, there are times when I catch myself with some, the beginnings of anxiety or worry or anger, and it's like, okay, wait a minute, what's going on inside of me here? And what's going on inside of me is, instead of delightfully depending on God for whatever it is that I have in mind, I am now trusting me or trusting someone to come through for me. Mark 10, 15 said, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. We become Christians not because, because we try hard or, or because we think being spiritual is a good thing. We become Christians because God can do for me what I cannot do for myself. He loves me. He died for me on a cross. He forgives me every day. He picks me up. He is a merciful God no matter how I failed yesterday or the day before or tomorrow. Nobody loves me like God can. And because of that, I can rest as a little child and depend upon him. As we sang a few minutes ago, I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. 
Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And here, life is not meaning physical life, like breathing, or even things that produce life, like food and water or sleep. But he's talking about an entity, that which we are chasing, that sense of satisfaction, that sense of peace, that sense of contentment, that it that we constantly are chasing. This is what he comes to give to us. And we say, nah, 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 nah it can't be that easy. I I'm going to find life the way I want to. That was me in college. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So here he says, you know, if you forget this, when you go outside, look up at those birds. Jesus said, none of those birds were involved in the food chain. None of, none of them were sowing seed. None of them were cultivating seed. None of them were harvesting seed. They were consumers. And the imagery of a bird is meant to remind us of our Heavenly Father who takes care of even birds. Verse 28, why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Again, another visual. You walk outside uh, our foyer, you're going to see a bunch of roses and a bunch of flowers that Melanie Foster tends for us uh, year round. And, and that's an image. It's a metaphor. It's in the same way that there's beauty there. I decide, uh, want to provide that for you. Verse 30. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now, it, very oftentimes, both personally and in talking to Christians, there are times where, where we sort of, when we're honest, we say, man, my faith seems so puny. It seems so small. I don't care how many times I've seen the goodness of God, as we also sang about here in, just a few minutes ago. I don't see how many times I've seen things happen and God take care of things. And yet the next time something happens, I'm, oh, no, what's going to happen? What, what, you know, what, what do I need to do? Our faith is puny. But what Jesus says, you're looking in the wrong direction. When we're looking inward to find our faith, usually we're not gonna, that's not going to be an encouragement to us. Faith is based on the character and the sovereignty of God. In other words, faith is a verb. It's not a noun. Faith is not, well, I believe in God. I believed in God up until the moment I became a Christian. I was no more Christian than a man on the moon. Just believing that God exists is not faith. Faith is a verb. I am trusting God with who I am. Uh, how do we trust God? Well, there are five things I want to mention. Number one, we obey his commands. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you, to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Now, all of God's people thought they were great at obeying his commands. And the problem was they weren't. They were pretty terrible, like we're pretty terrible at it. It does not come naturally to any of us. <clears throat> and so how do you make... Two million people aware uh, of, the, of this, this awful drive to control and, and stress produce themselves, self-induce themselves with stress. God humbles them. He humbled them and tested them. Why? So that they would know what was in their heart. He already knew what was in their heart. So that they would know what was in their heart. In Exodus 16, verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. It's what the, what the Bible calls manna. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this, day I will, in this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. This is a pretty amazing thing. I, sometimes, I, you know, you, you see on the news these people who went out on a hike and, you know, and they go missing and no matter how long we search for them, nobody finds them. I think recently I, I, I read something about here in Southern California, somebody was gone for months and they just found his body. Now, I have been lost in the woods before. 
Thankfully, I was not far from civilization. But when I think about my ability to rely on myself, lost in the forest, even near civilization, I don't give, I don't give myself much of a fighting chance. The only thing I could see was little green apples on one tree, and worms had eaten into every one of them. I thought, well, if, depending on how desperate I get, <laughs> out, out there on a hot day with no water. I mean, this is the stupid way to live, go on a hike. These two million people were in the equivalent of the Mojave Desert for 40 years. 40 years. I doubt I'd last three days. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people will go out each day and gather enough for that day. It was no problem for God to feed 2 million people for 40 years out in the desert. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. And here, provision is linked with obedience. It's a simple thing. If, if God has to turn off the financial spigot in our lives to, for us to learn this, he will. And it's no problem for him to turn that spigot back on. Second way we trust God is to turn to God for personal nourishment. By personal nourishment, I mean things like a sense of importance about myself, uh, validation, a sense of being loved, uh, secure, uh, significant, that my life matters. Uh, as opposed to emptiness and loneliness and, and why am I here and, and life, is there really any purpose to life and, and the feelings of sometimes of, of just utter discouragement and despair. When we trust ourselves or other people, this is the land at which we are slowly moving towards. It's a simple cause and effect regarding who or what am I really trusting for my sense of well-being. In Deuteronomy 8.3, he humbled you, causing you to hunger. In other words, reaching down and turning off that spigot for two million people temporarily. And then feeding you with manna, turning that spigot back on. Which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone. That's the moral of this story. They learned a metaphor with bread that also had to do with something deeper and more important, and that's our personal lives, who we are as people. We need more than just bread, physical bread. We need the bread that God provides our souls for our sense of value. <clears throat> this moral story is kind of is interesting because it reminds me of a story of a fifth grade class where the fifth grade teacher told her class, now, I want you to go home and ask your parents to tell you a story that has a moral to it. And come back tomorrow, and I'll give you an opportunity to tell your story. So the next day, she said, okay, now I want some of you to stand up and tell your story and the moral of the story. And so Lucy raised her hand, and the teacher called on Lucy. And Lucy said, well, we live on a farm, and we, make, um, we, we have hens, and they make eggs, and we take eggs to market. Oh, good. But one day, we put all our eggs in one basket, and on the way to the market, we went over a bump, and the egg basket went flying, and all the eggs crashed on the floor. And, uh, and the teacher said, oh, well, okay, well, what, what lesson? What's, what's the moral of the story? And she said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Oh, splendid. Does somebody else have a story? And, uh, and so Judy raised her hand, and Judy wanted to tell. We also live on a farm, and, um, and we raise chickens, but in order to have chickens, we have to, we have, to have eggs and, and help them to come to the point where they hatch. And one time recently, we, we had 12 eggs that were supposed to hatch in the chickens, but only 10 made it out of the shell. Oh, splendid, Judy. Well, what's the moral of the story? Well, the moral of the story is don't count your chickens until they hatch. Well, Jack had a story, and he, he was you know, wildly waving his hand. And let me just say, if you're a new teacher, and you see a fifth grade boy wildly raising his hand, wanting to speak, that's not a good idea to call on him. <laughs> I'm just telling you. So, well, and so this is a new teacher. Yes, Jack, tell us your story. Well, my daddy told me the story about my Aunt Karen. And my Aunt Karen was in Desert Storm during the war, and she was up in an airplane. Her airplane got shot out of the sky, and she had to escape out of the airplane in her parachute. And the only thing she had with her was a bottle of whiskey a machine gun. 
and a machete. And the teacher is just horrified. Why did I call on Jack? And so the teacher, well, what happened? And all the kids, of course, are like, you know, just totally engrossed. You can have your chicken story and hen story. I want to hear this story. And so, well, what happened? Well, Aunt Karen finally made it down and she realized she was, she had about 100 enemy soldiers around her. She was surrounded. She took her machine gun and she killed about 80 of those soldiers. And the teacher was just mortified. And, and then there were still 20 left, so she took her machete. And she killed another 10 soldiers with her machete until the blade broke. And then, and then the last 10 she killed with her bare hands. And the teacher was just completely mortified. Oh my gosh, how could you tell that story to our class? Does, does, does that story have a moral to it? And, and Jack said, yeah. My daddy says, stay away from Aunt Karen when she's been drinking. <laughs> Number three, we trust God when we yield control to him. Exodus 16, 19, Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of the manna until morning. Okay, so, so put on your prognostication hat. God's going to provide, he says, manna every day. On the sixth day, he's going to provide enough for day six and seven. Nothing is falling on day seven. And he says, every day when you go out there, there's going to be enough manna for you and your family. Don't take more. Now, knowing human nature the way you do, what do you think happened when that manna came down? Oh, man, people were out there scrounging all the, scrounging all the manna they could, they could take with them. Disobeyed because it seemed like this is what I need. This is what I should have. And I need, I need to have control about this. Verse 20. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. In other words, they took more than they needed. And they kept some for the rainy day of tomorrow, they thought. But it was full of maggots and began to smell. Not a good idea. Yield control to God. Here is a metaphor about daily trust. Richard mentioned this in his devotional. Trust from God's point of view is a daily endeavor. And it's not just daily trusting him for finances or for food or provision. It's trusting him with who we are as people, with, with that life that we are, are seeking to, to find in him and to give that life to other people. We are trusting him daily through the course of a day for these things. The problem is we just hate living dependently. There's something in us that just says, I don't want to do that. Number four, realize he is trustworthy. Nehemiah 9.20 says, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths. You gave them water for their thirst. Two million people for 40 years. For 40 years, you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. God is trustworthy. The last thing we'll mention is remember God can provide as he sees fit. Joshua 5, 12, the, the, the people had finished their 40 years. They crossed into the Jordan River. They are now in the promised land, finally, after 40 years. And on the first day they're in the promised land, guess what happened? The manna stopped. Why? Because now they were eating food from the promised land. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. Now in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews makes an interesting observation here. Behind the second curtain of the temple is a room called the most holy place. And the only person that can go back there is the high priest once a year. Nobody else goes back there which had the golden altar of incense, the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna. Once a year, when the high priest went in there, he, he was reminded that God was able to provide for the whole nation during all those 40 years. Well, as we wrap up, it's not about bread, as Jesus has said. Jesus said in John 6, I am the bread of life. 
Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died, meaning at some point we all die. They didn't die of starvation. God provided for that. But at some point, we all die. And yet he uses the, the metaphor, he's used the metaphor of bread or food, physical, for the bread or food that our souls need, that our hearts need to feel valuable and important, to feel loved and cared for. Here is the bread that comes down from heaven, a different kind of bread, Jesus said, which a man may eat and not die. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. We are not here this morning just because we love to get up early and come to church and sing songs and hear a message. We are here because we have new life in us and it's been given to us. Not because we've been so great as Christians or such great moral people, because generally speaking, we're just sort of all moral losers. And yet, and yet God in his mercy accepts us and brings us in and is working to, to slowly, slowly build the life of Christ in us. So I just want to ask you a question as we finish up here. Which metaphor of trust are you really banking on? Are you trusting on the metaphor of the desert? I can trust me. I can trust my spouse to do for me what I hunger for. I can trust my kids and my teenagers to do for me what I hunger for. I can trust my parents to, 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 to be for me what, what I need them to be. Like me in college, good luck with that. Good luck with that. We, are all, we all are prone to trust crutches that are weak that are just not sustainable. Over here is trusting God. And I don't know if you've seen this on the news, but there's a new crutch, apparently, the hurricane, the hurricane trust, the hurricane crutch. It has three little legs on it and can, you know, apparently you can climb mountains with a hurricane crutch. <laughs> now, as Christians, we all say we're trusting God. But my question is, in your daily life, what is your real Real, real, real trust. What are you really banking on? And if it's you or your spouse or your kids or your work or your money, then you have, for the moment, slid from this side of the stage over to this side of the stage. And God can reach down however he wants to, and sometimes it's with money, and turn off the spigot to awaken us, or he'll use anxiety, or worry, or fear, or anger when we double down, to say, this is the stupid way to live. I really need to be over here. This is my daily experience. This happens to me, again, between five to ten times a day. It should not be surprising to you as Christians if this also happens to you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you do not leave us alone and um, <clears throat> to go on our what we think is merry way, to live life and to try to get the things that we want from ourselves or people. We really do need you. Not just in a theoretical sense, but in a, a daily sense. Maybe this whole thing for you is, I never understood Christianity. Maybe this morning, maybe you're, you're seeing differently. This is not about religion. It's not about being religious. It's really about who am I really trusting for my life, my daily life, and my future. Nobody loves us like Jesus. How do I know that? He died for you and me. I have yet to have anybody else do that for me, and not even close. He loves us. He cares about us. He wants to give us that thing we're chasing that we call it, what he calls life. But it won't happen apart from trusting him with who I am, ultimately, and not trusting myself. Can't be done that way. Maybe <clears throat> this morning you realize Seth, I understand that I am just like those people you described who go out and, and, and grab more than they should, 
who disobey. That's what the Bible calls sin. Welcome to the club. We're all, we all are sinners. But I also understand that Jesus died for sinners. He died for people like me, for Seth, and for people like you to begin to transform us, to cleanse us from this element that's in our heart of sin and to make us a new person in Christ. And maybe this morning you would just say in delightful dependence to God, God, I don't know really much about this Christianity thing. But I resonate with what I'm hearing today. And I thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me to give me new life, real life. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Help me to walk with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.